And um, it's going to be a, a, a change, a good change that we can experience together. So um, let your friends know. You can know that you can be online if you're sick and you need to watch it. It'll be not only online now, but it'll be recorded for you so that you can see it later on as well. So today is exciting, too, because we're starting a new reading plan. Actually, we started it last week. If you don't have one, let me know. I'll be glad to get you one. We'll put them out here on the table for when we um, dismiss here. And we're going through the book of Colossians. The Col and Colossians is an awesome book. It's probably the most Christ-centered book in the Bible. It's better written to the church of Colossae. And um, if you've been reading the first chapter, it's just really an incredible book. And the difficulty is going to be to get through it in four weeks. But um, we're going we're gonna to have God... Um, guide us and direct us, especially me in the morning message. And so um, let's go to the Lord before we do anything else. Father, we are grateful for your love for us. We are thankful for your gift of your son, Jesus, who makes us right with you as a result of his suffering, as a result of his death, and a result of his resurrection. And Father, we pray this morning that you would... Um, Speak to each of our hearts as only you can do. Lord, you know where we need wisdom. Lord, you know where we need encouragement. Lord, you know where we need discipline. Lord, you know what we need. You're a good, good father. You're a perfect father. And nobody loves us like you do. And Father, so this morning, Lord, we are, we are our eyes and our ears and our hearts are open to you. We want to hear your voice. We want you to change us from the inside out, that you might be given glory and praise through our lives, both now and forevermore. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, most of you are probably familiar with the book by Robert Fulgham. You may not know the name. I didn't, but I recognize the book title. The book title is, All I Ever Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. And he writes about things like life and death and joy and pain and sorrow and after reading and studying through the first chapter of Colossians this past week, I feel like I could write a book very similar, only it would be all that I ever learned or all that I ever needed to know, I learned in Sunday school. Because if you went to Sunday school, um, if, even if you were goofing off and the teacher asked you a question, what, what was your always your answer? It was always one word, right? It was always Jesus. Jesus was the answer for everything. That, that's just what you said because that was the answer. And, and this morning's message is actually called, why is it always about Jesus? Why is Jesus always the answer? Is he always the answer? And, and our Christianity claims that Jesus is all we have and Jesus is all we need. And he's the answer for everything. But why is it always about Jesus? Today, our first installment of the series of the Letter of the Colossians, we're going to answer that very question. So open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to begin with Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. A powerful section here explaining why is it always about Jesus. And the first reason is because of who he is. And I call this, Jesus is supreme in identification. There is no one like him. Look what it says in verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God. If we want to know what God looks like, how God reacts, um, not looks like physically, but who he is, his character, we just simply look at Jesus. He is the only one that perfectly re reflects and uh, represents the invisible God. So we, we make Jesus top priority because he lets us know what God is like. I mean, we see Jesus healing. We see Jesus with compassion, with comfort, encouragement, challenging. Um, we see Jesus' love. And so the first thing is, is that he is the exact representation of God. He's the only one that perfectly re reveals the God that's invisible. He, he brings it so that we can see who God is. And then it says here, he's the firstborn over all creation. I have Jesus is greater than the creation. And, and firstborn here is not an event. It's a title. 
When we think of firstborn, we think, well, my brother Larry was the firstborn. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about firstborn in that he is the supremacy. He's the supreme. He's preeminent. He's above all. That's what it means. That's what, that's what firstborn means. And he's the firstborn over all creation because he existed before creation even began. When your kids ask the question, who made God? That's, that's the end. That's where you stop. You can't go back any further. God always was. God always is. And remember, Jesus said, I am, right? Before Abraham was, I am. Meaning, I've always been. I have no beginning. I have no end. And that is so hard for us to grasp. But the reality is, is that Jesus is greater than the creation. And he was there before creation. And, and look at what it says here. It answers two of the most basic questions of life. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rules or authorities. And then this, here it is. All things have been created through him and for him. If you want to know what, who created you, where did you come from? God created you in his image. God created you. That is awesome. That's where you came from. The God of all eternity created you. So that answers our biggest question. One of our biggest questions, where did I come from? And then our next big question is, what am I here for? And it tells us in this verse, all things have been created through him and for him. My purpose in life, your purpose in life is to bring God glory. That's it. It's not comfort. It's not making a living. It's not raising a family. It's not um, getting a job. It is bringing God glory through your family, through your job. But it's preeminent. It's, it's top. Do you understand what I'm saying? It is, it is your responsibility is to bring God glory. So when your kids are giving you a hard time, you have to stop and go, wait a minute. I, I have to bring God glory here. And how do we do that? We do that by discipline. We do that by loving them, by using grace, by um, encouraging them in the Lord. Uh, there's so many different ways. But my purpose in life and your purpose in life is to go give God glory. That brings a new meaning to suffering. That brings a new meaning to things that happen to you. The point is, is that we're looking at the fact that, that Jesus is the answer and so Jesus is all supreme, and it's in his, who he is. He is greater than creation. And Jesus is the explanation. He explains why we're here and what we're here for. And then Jesus is in charge of the congregation, it says in verse 18. Oh, wait, let me do 17. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, I understand that scientists believe that they don't know what holds the atom together. And... Um, the reality is, is this, the Bible tells us that God holds it all together. I'm not smart enough to figure all that out. That may be true and it might not be. I don't know. I'm not smart enough to figure that out. But I do know he holds my life together. I do know that, that God in, encourages me and helps me and walks with me. And, and when I'm falling apart, he holds me together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. The very point of the first point is, is that Jesus is supreme over all. There is none like him. There, he's got a category all to himself. We say holy, 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 because one holy isn't enough to describe the character of God. So it's who he is. So there's no one greater than Jesus. So it makes sense that when we go along and we say, why is it always about Jesus? Because there is no one greater. Because he is greater and rules over all the creation. Because he is the one who created me. He is the one who loves me. He is the one who we're going to see died for me. So you can't go any higher. So when, when you're on the phone, when you talk to God and, and you don't say, I want to talk to your supervisor. You know, if you call and you complain, you get on the phone, you go, hey, I, you don't get anywhere with that person. You go, I want to talk to your supervisor. There is no one higher than God. And guess what? You have direct communication with him. You can talk to him. He listens to you. The creator of the universe. If you start to, to pull this apart and start to really think about it, it really stretches your mind. But there is no one greater than Jesus. Now, that's what who he is. 
Then he's also, um, why is it always about Jesus? Because Jesus, of what Jesus did, he is supreme in salvation. Look, Paul goes from, for God is pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. That's the incarnation, God in the flesh. Fully God, not 50%, not 75%, 100% God, all of his fullness dwelling in Christ. Verse 29 tells us what he did. And through him to reconcile all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Right here is God's grace in Jesus, that he died on a cross, that we can have eternal life, that we can have peace with God through his blood shed on the cross. And that's what the uh, Colossians had experienced. And, and Paul is writing to them saying, don't get off track here. It is obvious that Jesus is, is the grace that God sent to you and you received that. You have a, taken on that. You've trusted that. And, and it says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind, verse 21, because of your evil behavior. Think about it a minute. Without Christ, you are lost. Without Christ, you have no hope. Without Christ, you are doomed. Without Christ, you are subject to God's judgment. Without Christ, you are lost. Without Christ, your life is nothing. It's you're, you're dead man walking. Without Christ, there is no Christianity. Without Christ, there is no abundant life. Without Christ, there is no salvation. There's no other name under heaven in which you can be saved. So this is the most important decision that you can make in your entire life because you are born an enemy with God. And somebody needs to do something about it, and Jesus did. And it cost him, he made peace through his blood, verse number 20. Verse 13, uh, verse 12, giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you. See, you don't qualify yourself. God qualifies you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Do you see what kind of future we have? For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Whether you believe it or not, whether you understand it or not, because if you've trusted Christ, when he sees you, it's you are perfectly spotless, without blemish. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not the reality of my life. I'm not perfectly spotless, without blemish. But positionally, not practically, positionally, when, when God looks at me, he sees Christ's righteousness, and he goes, there, Scott, he is holy and blameless. Man, can you grasp that? <laughs> I mean, like, I know what my life's like. I know what my thought life is. I know what things I say and do. And, and Christ took care of that by his redemption, giving us forgiveness of sins. So um, the reality here is, is that salvation is good news. It's good news. Look at what he says in verse um, 22. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body. See, he had to be man and he had to be God. And through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Wow, that's your position before the Lord. He made you holy and righteous. And salvation is found in no other than Jesus. There is no other rescuer. There's no other redeemer. There's no other savior. There's no other payment. That's available for your sin. When you stand before God, you are either in or out. And you are either in Christ or out of Christ. One of the two. I know this is stuff we know. Maybe we know. Maybe we don't know. But I'm, I, what, what um, Paul is trying to do here is he's trying to say that Christ is supreme. Like it's always about him. So it's not only about him because of who he is. It's not only about him because he what he did on the cross and his resurrection, too. I didn't even put that in there, his resurrection. Jesus is also supreme in transformation. That's what Christ is doing in us. He takes residence up in us. He tells us that in chapter 1 over at verse. Let's just start with verse 3. Look what Paul says. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. I, I want you to see here. 
that in Colossians 2, the whole Trinity's here. The Father's here, the Son's here, and the Spirit's here. All three of them have gotten together to bring you salvation and to bring transformation in your life. He says, when we pray for you, because we've heard of your faith in Christ and of the love you have for all people, all God's people. He's saying it is evident. People has told us about your life in Christ, the faith you have, the love you have that springs up from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you've already heard. It's the true message of the gospel, the good news that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it's been doing amongst you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. He's saying the grace of God is working in you to transform your heart. It's because Jesus lives in you. Look at verse 8. And who also told us of your love in the Spirit. God has given you His power, His ability by the Spirit taking up residence in your life, in your flesh. He lives in you to empower you. There's, now there's um, a, a solution to your addiction. There's a solution to your um, problems. There's a solution to your um, un. I want to say unpeace. What's the right word for that? Chaos for your um, struggle. And it's, it's found nowhere else. Remember, we're looking at why is it that the answer is always Jesus? And it's because, all right, it's because of who he is. It's because of what he's done with salvation. And it's because what he's doing inside of us. He says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is not just heaven, but the here and now that Jesus works in us, lives in us, transforms us. He, he ends this chapter by saying that, To this end, I strenuously contend, Paul says, with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. The Christian life is all about Christ living through you, in you. That's the point. So not only... <laughs> not only is it who he is, what he's done with salvation and that we've received and we become forgiven and clean before the Lord, before God, the father, but also he's transforming our hearts. He's changing us. There's hope that we we're not stuck, that we have the freedom to become all that God wants us to be. It's Christ powerfully working in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory, power for living is found only in Jesus. So the point here is, is that Jesus is the answer because of who he is, what he's done, what he's doing. And so now the question becomes, what have you done with Jesus? That's the thing. Because if you know him personally, if you know him personally, you can be assured when you know who he is, you know that he's a God that is also a, not only of love, but he's a God of discipline. He's a God of um, strength. He's a God of provision. He's the present God. When you start to realize who, who Jesus is and that he's with you, it changes everything. Supreme in salvation. When you know you're saved, you know this world is not all there is. You, you look around and go, this place is not my home. This is not my home. And all the struggles that I have here one day will be over. And if I know Christ, the most glorious future is coming up. That's why it's always about Jesus. Because without Him, we would never make it. Without Him, we would never have a future. Without Him, we would never have a hope. And, and this is what Paul says in verse 28. He is the one we proclaim. He is the one we proclaim. Not ourselves. Not what we do. We proclaim Jesus because he understands that Jesus is supreme in identification, salvation, and transformation. And now he's proclaiming him. Proclamation. Nothing more, nothing less. We don't add anything to Jesus. We don't take anything away from him. The truth is in here. This book reveals Jesus and our need for him. And it reveals what he's done for us and what he's doing in us. And so when we, we come and we, we do life, we do life differently. We, we do life with the understanding that Jesus died for us, loves us, is, is working in us. 
And, and so now, whenever our struggles, whenever our trials, whenever that comes, we can know it's Jesus. He's at work. We can know it's Jesus. He's, he's involved. We know it's Jesus that he allowed this in my life so that I could reflect his glory. Because remember, that's my purpose. My purpose is not comfort. My purpose is God's glory. It's pointing to Jesus. That's what our life is about. And, and Paul says here is, that's, that's who I proclaim. So the challenge to us is, is that who you're proclaiming in your work? Are you proclaiming Christ? Not just by what you say, but what you do. Both of them are important. Is that what you're, who you're proclaiming? Just, do people know that that's your bottom line? That's your base, that Jesus is the answer. Is it? <laughs> Paul says, that's who I proclaim. How about our church? Like, I've been convicted of this. You know, do I come and give you self-help things? Or do I come and point you to Jesus? This isn't about self-help. This is about God help. And this book is, is reorienting me toward the reality of Jesus is the answer. So when we start to struggle, we go to Jesus. When we start to struggle, we think of who Jesus is. When we start to struggle, we understand that Jesus died for us. And if he'll die for us, will he not freely also give us all things? The answer is Jesus. <laughs> I don't want to make it more complicated than that. All that I ever needed to know or learn, I learned in Sunday school. The answer is Jesus. And this is what Paul says here. It just really jumped off the page at me. Look at verse number six. And Paul's telling them that he is that he has come to you, the gospel, in the same way as bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. That's what it means. The gospel is, is the good news, and it's bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just like it should do in our hearts. It should bear fruit, and it should be growing in our life. Just as it's been doing, look, Paul says it, among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. So let me stop and say, do you understand God's grace? Do you understand what God has done for you? Because it's not about you. It's not about your works. It's not about what you have done or are doing. It's about what he has done. And I, and I emphasize that because in my life, you know, you know my story, most of you, is, is that I thought I would get to heaven, stand before God, and God would let me in because I did enough good stuff. And that is not how it works. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that your works are as filthy rags. You can't make it on your own. You need who? Jesus. See, he's the answer. It's what you do with Jesus that matters. Then he'll transform your heart. He gives you the ability to will and to do. And, and he says here, you've heard God's grace. You understand the gospel and it's producing fruit in you. And, and I love this is where God got a hold of me. You learned it from Epaphras or Epaphras. I've heard it pronounced both ways. You've learned it from some other dude. <laughs> How about that? When you receive Christ, if you've received Christ, um, it was probably through another person. For me, it was Tony Jackson, the pastor here. So many years ago, whatever it was. It was a person. That's a challenge to us right here. To those of us who know the gospel, the good news. Yes, Christ could have done, God could do it any way he wants. And he can do it with people just reading the Bible. Don't get me wrong. He can do that. But for the majority of people, there's someone involved that is sharing the Lord with them, that is sharing what Christ has done for them. And we got to get busy because our time is short. I don't know. Christ could come back today, right? We don't know. But I know you have people in your family, just like I have people in my family that don't know the Lord. I know that you have people at work that don't know the Lord. Bill was telling me the other night that he heard on the news, and I, I don't I have the percentages totally right, but you won't need me to when you hear what I'm about to say. The 93 or 95 percent of America in the, in the 70s, Bill, is that what it was? In, in 1970, agree, um, would say that they were Christians. Now that number is like 32 percent. And we wonder why we have problems on airplanes. 
And we wonder why we have problems with gun violence. And we wonder why we have problems in our schools. Why? Because we've kicked the answer out. And you and I need to get out there and share the gospel with people because it's what they need. It's the answer to everything that they're dealing with. And so when you have counseling, make sure it's with a Christian counselor, somebody who knows the Lord and loves the Lord and can bring you to the answer. I was listening to Tony Evans the other night, uh, and if you get an opportunity to listen to it, it's on YouTube. It's uh, his address to the uh, Religious Broadcasting uh, Association in 2021. And he talks about God shaking up our world. He's shaking us up. He's shaking the church up. That's what this whole COVID thing's about. God is using it to shake us up and to realign ourselves with what's, what's important. And this is the book we go to. And this is, this is where we start because it tells us all about who Jesus is. So are we being faithful in sharing the gospel? The Spirit will provide us everything we need. It's always about Jesus because he's supreme over all things. No one's greater. He brings peace with God. His power works in us. We can proclaim him and him alone, and we can strenuously contend to him. So I just want to end with this, this point. My life is about Jesus. My work is about Jesus. My struggles are about Jesus. My successes are about Jesus. My marriage is about Jesus. My career is about Jesus. My cancer is about Jesus. My suffering is about Jesus. And I don't mean that to sound flippant. Suffering is tough. It is hard to go through. It, it, can, it, can really, it can really bring us down. It can really discourage us. It can really be hurtful. But what I want you to know is that there's one there who's the answer, that Jesus. He, and even when you can't hold on to him, he's holding on to you. He is always faithful. And we are here to bring him glory, not to bring ourselves comfort, that we might bring glory to him through our lives and through the things we say and do. So we start off this book with the reality of the th things he's going to deal with in chapters 3 and 4 all come out of this passage of 15 through um, 20, 29 there. Um, he's going to come back to that again and again and again. Why? Because the answer is always Jesus. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy. What an awesome God you are. Father, Jesus is an indescribable gift. And Father, I pray that there's no one here that has rejected the gift of salvation. Peace with God. One day he will stand before God and he is a God of judgment. And he can't look the other way with sin. And he has dealt with that on the cross in his son. He freely gave his own son who freely came and to be obedient to the Father because he loved the world. And he gave himself for it. Father, that we might have eternal life, that we might have hope, that we might have joy, that we might have purpose, that we might know where we came from, that we might jo enjoy intimacy with him. And Father, if we don't have that relationship with Christ, we are missing out. We're not even living. He came to give us life and life more abundant. And Father, I pray that if there's anybody here that's never trusted Christ, that, Lord, this morning would be the day that they would just say, Lord, would you be my Savior? Would you forgive my sin? Father, I'm trusting what you did on the cross, that you died for me. That what the Bible says is true, that when I trust you with my heart, and it comes from my heart, Father, that, that you will show me the, how you will transform my life. And I will pass from death to life when, we, when I repent and turn towards you. Father, it just takes an admission of sin, a belief in Christ. And Father, then, then you give us the gift of salvation. And for those of us who know you, Lord, there's so many other things that we can make preeminent, that we can make important in our life. And Lord, we mess it up all the time. And Father, I thank you that this week as we go through our trials and our struggles and our problems, we remember the answer is Jesus. We remember to come to you. That you, might, that you might reveal your will 
and, and give us understanding in your spirit, Paul says in this, in this first chapter. That, that we would come to live a life worthy of the Lord. That, Father, that you would bear fruit in and through us. That we would grow in the knowledge and the intimacy of you. Because, Father, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the solution. Jesus is the only one. And, Father, I pray that this week as we go, that we would remember that. That we would, that we would find comfort in that. That we would find encouragement in that. And, Father, thank you for being awesome and loving us that much that you would send your own son. And thank you for Jesus who was obedient and came and did your will and that he's a friend of sinners. And Father, thank you too that the Holy Spirit now lives inside of us in order that we may fulfill the works that you've given us to do, not to earn salvation, but because of salvation. And may you receive glory and praise from our lives, from our work, from our raising our families, from our finances, from our um, friends. All of those things, God, we look forward to that. Thank you for Jesus. We love him. We ask all these things in his powerful and precious name. And we ask it in his name. Amen. All right. You helping me, Greg? Uh -huh. All right.